Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we are taking another look at JD Garage's channel as he's decided to build himself an $800 plasma system and of course make the title of the video catchy so once again like homemade madness he can compete and catch the wave with the hot topic of the week. Now we're going to go through this build and I've already cut up the video to show you exactly what you need to pay attention to. Now so many guys out there get butt hurt when I do videos like this but the guys that really appreciate it are the ones that really want success. We're not here to make friends. We're not here to be the most popular guy. You should want to have your robot be stable and be productive. That's why you invest the money in the first place. So let's jump right in. Difficult things about assembling the XL is making sure these tubes are parallel. We took a long time squaring this up when we... And just like clockwork, the content creator does as many of them before him have always done. And that is that they discuss the areas that they're familiar with. I want you guys to get in the habit of paying attention to what they don't discuss. Like some things here that are obvious on screen. Like the fact that he's already coated the chassis with some type of coating because it's red. Now, of course, he wants to present the chassis like he knows what he's doing. Unfortunately, what he doesn't discuss is that when you apply a coating to the metal, it affects its ability to conduct electricity. And what does that mean? That means that when you go to properly ground the chassis, if it's above a 3 ohms rating for resistance, you do not have as fast a direct path to ground, which once again can destabilize the robot by contaminating the step and direction signals of it. So therefore, let me ask you a question, all of you, including the ones that get pissed off, because you're the ones I, I kind of find humorous. If I piss you off because I tell you the truth, then my question is, should I not say anything and just wait for you guys to have robots that you piss money away on that fail? Doesn't make sense. Who cares what the robot's painted with if it doesn't perform? These are logical questions. Why would you give your money to someone who, by definition, doesn't understand what they're so-called teaching. You don't believe me? All right, guys, so we can see the lead coming off of the shielded cable where he's attached them to his motors. He feels he's doing this correct. I'm asking you, is he? Think about it. We've just identified that his chassis has a coating on it. He never mentioned at all about removing that coating. He never discusses anything about grounding the chassis. Yet we have a shield drain that's terminated on the end of where the motor is. This is not best practice. Why? Because the motor itself, we already know, is going on to a chassis that he's already coded, again, not identifying it. But in best practice, all of your grounding should be done back at your electronics enclosure through a ground bus. I've discussed this many times. I practice the same principle myself. What's really interesting, and this is the thing that never, I never really will ever make sense of. If I saw someone doing a video on something I didn't understand, I would use that knowledge to my benefit. It never happens. Think about that. How interesting is that? Are we not humble enough to say, hey, you know what? Maybe he's got a point. I'll look into this. No, he goes right back to selling plans, unfortunately, to people that get burned. And believe you me, they do get burned. Look on screen here what I'm presenting you. I want you to read these things carefully because I'm saving you money and all you're doing is watching my video. Think about it. Well, we got the control panel built. We wanted to give you a good view of this before we install it in the box. We also wanted to test it. Um, we've got the new uh, ESP32 controller that we've started to switch our units over to. Uh, we've updated all the drivers uh, for a more powerful, uh, better profile driver. And we've gone to a higher voltage power supply that's gonna give us a tremendous uh, increase in motor output uh, compared to the current setup on the Gen 2 model. So 
those upgrades we have going on in the machine. We also have an opto isolation bank. Uh, we'll get into that in a future video, what that's for, but hook this up and we're gonna do testing. We're gonna test the motors, make sure they're working before we drop it all in the box. Hey guys, jump over to eDealers Direct Automation and check out my eBay store for the components used to make what you see in this video, as well as many others that you may not even realize you need. Of course, I'm always there if you have questions, message me and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And of course, I do do custom engineering as well as consultations. Thank you for watching this video and your support. Take care. All right, it's really interesting. He's claiming to be on his Gen 2 model and he's saying he updated the controller of this unit. He used USB on the first generation, and now on the second generation, he's still using USB. And what's really funny is, here is the truth as to why he switched to this type of controller. So it went from one USB, which is universal serial bus, to another Available USB. Then. So we're switching out to this new controller. Uh, Spec-wise, we're going from a eight bit 32 megahertz speed to a 32 bit 240 megahertz speed so it, it's quite a bit more powerful and faster controller and 30 bucks for an arduino uno seven dollars for an esp32 so we got a 23 dollars cost savings in the machine by moving to this and once again most of you already know that universal serial bus if you follow my channel at all over the last 10 years have realized that universal serial bus is completely unstable for cnc use i have more and more potential clients and clients switching over from usb every day it sucks it's shit stay away from it the more i've said it the more guys will go and test the water to see if i'm correct that's fine do what you want i'm putting on screen factual information the question is is how many of you have the attention span to watch through the video and see what i'm saying is accurate that's all you have to do because unless these other people who i have no association with are lying then they're telling you this is what the case is when you utilize usb it's only running on five volts i've said this before and it's highly susceptible to electromagnetic interference on top of grounding issues on top of the fact that i've discussed this with balzis over at cnc drive who once again is their lead engineer not in the u.s in hungary where they've developed the uc100 used to be at one time one of the most if not the most popular usb motion controller and it used to disconnect it had problems all the time with different cpu issues as far as what's running in the background and then on top of that we deal with the typical grounding not me saying this him saying this when i questioned him because i noticed all kinds of issues with this unit not only did i notice all kinds of issues with this unit but many other units and therefore that's why i'm presenting you this information especially with a cnc plasma system because if you mess with usb with these devices you are asking for trouble so we're going to go ahead and get the micro switch mounted for the end stop and the auto squaring on the y-axis so all right i see this on so many videos of plasma builds and it never makes any sense let alone on someone who once again is trying to sell plans as if he's an authority and understands this concept of robotics when you guys use snap switches on these tables at all the thing to keep in mind is most of you are going to be using a water table makes sense the issue is is electricity and water don't mix electronics and water don't mix you should be using the proper waterproof switches when you utilize a water table now you don't have to take my word for it this to me is just pure common sense if you are using standard snap switches you're waiting for a problem to happen now many of you will say well you know what i don't have that problem yet that's fine you're no different than the guy jumping out of a plane and saying you know what my odds are better every time i jump out of the plane because for some reason i think i'm gaining some sort of experience yeah you're experiencing not hitting the ground this time fact here's what you need to understand do things right and don't do them again you'll save yourself a bunch of headache a bunch of heartache 
save tons of problems with your better half and best of all you'll save more money even if it takes longer to acquire it the first time this is fact if you purchase the wrong equipment with CNC just like anywhere else all you're going to end up doing is more work to replace those inferior pieces of equipment and then on top of that how much downtime can you ensue think about what I'm saying all our limit switch cables made and we just put the aviation connector on it and a couple of female uh, spade terminals on the end so we'll get these hooked up um, we've got them all labeled where they go this one's short all right guys once again we're going down the rabbit hole of how much money we can spend to correct all of these errors i'm saving you that money from the get-go the guys that are watching up until this point you do not ever just use standard cable on any application dealing with cnc robotics very 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 few applications namely anything dealing with inputs dealing with switches so if we're dealing with a switch on a plasma robot which generates the largest amount of emi on any robot there is you will want to use just like all the other cnc production robots double shielded cable to mitigate both forms of high and low frequency emi now i do get arguments now and then that you know my robot only sees this or technically robots only are in high frequency you guys forget one thing and when i bring this up there's never an argument to it what about your shop environment? Are we just mitigating the EMI that's present on the robot? Or are we trying to mitigate not just the robot's general production of EMI, but also where that robot is going to be in lieu of the application that you're running? So if we're in a basement or we're in you know, a commercial environment, are we not to say that there's other electronics that's presenting EMI? Think about what I'm saying. Wouldn't it be better to have a gun with a silver bullet when we're dealing with a werewolf than worrying about, well, you know what, if I shoot him enough times, he might go down? Are you that guy? Be that guy. I'm trying to help you. If you watch this far, you must be interested in what I'm saying or you would have tuned out already. You can go back to this guy and spend 60 bucks on plans and hope to God that you might get a robot that's stable. Or we can do it right and you can thank me later because you took your time and you spent your money the right way cautiously and proceeded not only to do it right but thought about what you were doing before purchasing and that's the big thing I'm trying to make you guys think not just in logical sense but also think in detail and that's what you pay me for that's what engineers are paid for they're paid to look at the detail the detail that saves hopefully you money or makes your life easier So here is the portion of the bill where once again he's completing his water table confirming my switch selection. Guys, I'm telling you right now, anything dealing with water and if you're building a plasma table, you, most of you will be using that water table. Make sure your switch rating is IP67. If you're using proximity switches, I get that question a lot. That's fine if you want to do it. They're more work than snap switches. I'm not a big fan of either. But if you're going to implement them, make sure that they're rated for the proper application. No different than if you're a contractor and you're going to mount an exterior fan. You want to make sure that it's rated for exterior use because it's not technically going to be rated if it's inside for the elements so keep these things in mind these details count and they will save your pocketbook that being said there's another key point I didn't discuss early in the video we're going to talk about it real quick now and that is the fact that he's using a plastic electronics enclosure plastic is an insulator it cannot be grounded if it can't be grounded you are going to be SOL when once again we have to make sure that that enclosure is grounded so that our electronics are protected once again a metal enclosure produces a Faraday cage effect don't take my word for it. Do your own research. It's, it's something you have to do to understand some of these excess forces that we're dealing with. And once you understand how EMI works, it will once again help you better get a grip on the elephant you're trying to swallow. 
That being said, I will put a small excerpt on screen here from Lincoln's PDF user's manual. And again, this is the Holy Bible on EMI and proper grounding technique. And I do offer this to anyone for free. You can get it. You can even download it from their site. And for those guys out there who are wanting to build a plasma right, this is the Holy Bible. You should spend all of your time understanding this information because once again, it saves you headaches and it will save your pocketbook. Thank you all for your support.